Well, first up, I want to thank everyone for coming, and I want to thank my panel for joining me today. Um, I know when I went through the registration list, I knew major a lot of the names on there. Um, I've met a lot of you guys through industry days and other events. Um, but for those of you guys who don't know me, my name is Stephanie Shutt. I am the director of the Multiple Awards Schedules Program Management Office, or in government speak, Mass PMO. So basically what I wanted to go through first is kind of how this panel is going to work today. What we're going to do is um, I'm going to do some talking points really quick, and then I'm going to turn it over to the panel members. They're going to introduce themselves, provide a brief history of their experience with the MASS program, and then they'll go into what they find great about the program and what they would change if they could change it, and any barriers they feel that we have towards industry with that. After the panel has given their thoughts, we'll turn it over to questions throughout the audience. Um, as Adam stated earlier, there are four mics, but if you want to stay in your seat because you're in the middle of the row, you can raise your hand and we will have someone with a microphone come towards you. So let's get started. So right now it's a really exciting time to be in the Multiple Word Schedules program. Um, over the last year, we started the implementation at a pilot basis with the order level materials, and we created that special item number, which was mass modded into a lot of contracts which has started to fill a gap that we've had in this program for a very long time. Um, we've also had some legislative wins. Over the last year, we've gotten the removal of the best interest determination and unpriced services. So these are things that are coming in the future um, based on other steps that need to be taken, but it's really great that we're starting to see these wins and see this movement with this program. So over this year, we're going to start the consolidation of the multiple award schedules program. We've made this very large with this huge screen graphic for this, and we're going to actually put this up so everyone will be able to have it. It will be on Interact. Um, so we'll put it out for there for those of you guys who don't want to have to take pictures of it with your phone, but if you would like to, go for it. <laughs> but so what I wanted to kind of do is go through what those phases mean. So one of the largest phases is going to be this fiscal year. And actually this phase started last fiscal year. So over the last fiscal year, we created an integrated project team. This included members throughout FAS. It included members from every acquisition center, every portfolio, anything that touched mass throughout the FAS, and also in other departments of GSA. We brought everyone together and basically put everyone in a room over three offsites to basically say, if you could fix this program, if you could change this program, how would you change it? And over multiple different things of issues that have come up and other things, this group came together and they agreed that the best step first was to consolidate this program. There are just too many contractors that are either stuck in one world where they don't have the resources to get an additional contract to actually provide their solution to market. And although the OLM SID does provide some assistance in this, it doesn't fix the entire problem. And then there are other contractors who have multiple contracts. I actually spoke with one group this morning who are trying to work their way through this weird teaming but sub and priming with themselves to provide a solution to an agency but it, they have two contracts, but they need both contracts, and how do we do this? And it's this weird, murky world that everyone has been working through over the last couple of decades. So what we've been doing over the last year is reviewing all the terms and conditions, and which condi terms and conditions are for everyone, and which ones are very specific to a category or subcategory. And then the next thing we've been doing is we've been looking at all the special item numbers. Where is their duplication? Where is their overlap? Why do we have these weird titles that make no sense? Why did we create all these numbers that no one knows? So when in agencies come to eBuy to pick something, to put something out, they just randomly pick a sin. And it's up to industry to contact them and say, oh, you have the wrong one. Don't do that one. So. We're trying to do things where we actually use real words so that when agencies are picking things or industry is trying to decide which categories that they want to be under, 
you actually understand what you're picking and you don't end up with something that is not even close to what you sell. So those are some of the things that we've been working on over the year. Um, so what we also realized is with, when consolidating with a contract this large, we would definitely need to use the existing category management that we've already started. We may need to clean it up a little bit, but utilizing that also helps with that subject matter expertise. I know that this question came up earlier today. This will help us retain some of that subject matter expertise, but creating this IPT that crossed so many acquisition centers, it also started to break down those silos so that the acquisition workforce could start learning from each other as well and start working more together as a group in an enterprise. So what we'll be doing is finishing all of this, making sure we do any system fixes that need to happen, and by the end of this fiscal year, we are going to be releasing a new schedule offering. And we're going to close down all the existing schedules to new offers. And we'll allow that new offering to open up and we'll watch it for a little bit to see if there are any system glitches and make sure it's all ready to go. And at that point, starting in January of 2020, we'll start mass modding everyone over to the new terms and conditions. When you mass mod over, just like when you do a mass mod today, you'll keep your same contract number. Um, so there won't be any need to be transferring orders or anything like that. It will just basically clean up some of those terms and conditions, some of them that you guys have had for a really long time that maybe should have been dealt with a couple years ago, but just haven't really gotten around to it. So it'll be fixing all of that. And then once everyone is mass monitored over, that's when we'll start the phase three, and that will be a more in depth part, but it will also be more independent based on that industry partner. So it's going to depend on how many contract vehicles you have and where those contract vehicles are in their life cycle. So if you have two, but one of them's ending in like a year and a half, and the other one's more of a follow-on, we'll let that one naturally end as it is in its current time period, because there's no point in consolidating something where it's going to be ending. So we'll be working with industry on the different options that you guys can take to consolidate those schedules, and we'll spend the rest of 2020 doing that. We do realize that there are going to be BPAs and everything like that, so we do realize that there's going to be at least a five-year process to get everything all synced up, because those BPAs are at least five years long. So that's kind of the high view of what's going to be happening for this. So one of the things I also wanted to talk on really, really quick before I turn it over to my panel is we've gotten a lot of frequently asked questions already that have started coming in since we've announced this. And there are some that I really wanted to talk on really quick just so we can get them out of the way. The number one question we've gotten is cooperative purchasing. What happens to it? Well, because of the registry, the regulatory and legislative restrictions around it, that cooperative purchasing will go down to that category level. It won't be expanded. The next thing will be TDR, the Transactional Data Reporting Rule. So with TDR, it will go down just like in Schedule 70 and the Professional Services Schedule. It will go down to those specific categories that are within that pilot, and it will stay within those categories. And the last one I have that has come up multiple times is if I am planning to get a new contract or I'm planning to get my first contract right now, should I wait? No. Please go ahead and do business as usual. We will work with you through all of this, but do not halt or wait for us to get caught up. Continue doing everything that you would normally be doing. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my panel members. We're gonna start with Betsy and work our way down and we'll end with Roger. And after Roger's done, we'll open it up for Q&A throughout the audience. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Betsy Cerullo. I'm CEO and owner of AdNet Account Net. First, I want to thank Stephanie, Crystal, and Emily for inviting us all here today for the opportunity to speak, to share some good things, and to share some not so good. Uh, my company has been in business for 29 years, thus my wonderful white top. Um, 
I, our company is management consulting, professional staff augmentation, executive search, and project management. Uh, we've been in the, the federal space for a little bit under 10 years, and I can tell you that once I made the decision, well, the recession pushed me into the federal space. Once I made the decision to come over here, I found that it really enlivened me as a business owner, in a good way. Uh, the federal space is filled with many puzzles, and I think those of us that are most successful are the ones that stay with the puzzle until it's complete. And as we know, sometimes it's never complete, but you never give up. So my work in management consulting and staff augmentation is in the areas of accounting and finance, human resources, and legal with a sweet spot with EEO. I am very passionate about workplace equality. Uh, I am a huge advocate for women and for all people in the diversity space and welcome all of my kindred spirits in the non-diverse uh, non -diverse side. I fight for people and companies who are not being treated fairly. So that's really the foundation of my company. So we are on the TAP schedule, which is the Temporary and Professional Services Schedule. I've uh, been on it since 2010. I was fortunate enough, right out of the box, to get a six-month contract. Someone in the Department of Education, I guess, was looking in the database and the timing was right and we got picked up. Because one of my stressors was when we got onto the schedule, oh my gosh, I only have like this much time to be able to use the schedule or else I'm gonna lose it. Um, but fortunately, that set the stage and it also opened up an opportunity for my company to be a subcontractor on a five-year contract with HHS and allowed me to form other partnerships. So where I'm going with this is while it can be cumbersome with the schedules, it continued to open up doors for me. So we are also 8A certified, have been in the program for two years. Because of my schedule, I was able to leverage both ways to get 8A sole source, 8 a competitive, and then uh, other flip side is when a contracting officer says, we can't put it in the A and A program, but I'm gonna put it out on GSA and you're gonna be one of the three. So I've been able to navigate both sides as a result of having the schedule. So uh, I think now it's probably time for me to talk about talk about the good the good stuff. So um, that's definitely a, a really wonderful thing about the schedule. I highly highly recommend that you stay with it. I know that there's a lot of people in the room here that are with large businesses and there's some that are small business. If it's cumbersome, don't give up. There's a lot of the large primes that are sitting out in the audience or listening today that need companies like us to fill the gaps because that's what we do. We come in when other people have messed up and we fix it and we clean it and we make it right. And the large primes need us. And oftentimes we have to be on the schedule to be able to be on the team, so stay with it. Um, one of the things that has been cumbersome for us, we were in the PSS process and we submitted our application in December of last year. Uh, stayed with it, kept in touch with the contracting officer, and at one point I just had to be a real pain in the neck and say, where is it at? And, need, and found out that it was stuck in the system. Well, we had the screenshot to show that we submitted it and it said it was submitted. So it was stuck in the system and we were advised to resubmit. So we resubmitted only to a couple of months later to get a rejection letter that our documentation was no longer valid because it was information from 2017. So that was not fun. And I know that we've all experienced it, and I'm sure those of you who are with GSA, you've, you've heard the story before. If, if you're gonna tell us to resubmit, give us the whole story so we can resubmit it the first time. When, you're, when you own a small business and when you have, you know, you don't have a lot of people on staff, resources are limited, and you need to get the job done. And you need just direction to be told how to get it done. So I still don't have the PSS. I can tell you at one point I was just like, forget it, forget it, for now. That's usually what it is. It's no, for now, forget it, for now. Because I don't give up, I'm a pain in the neck, 
in a good way, and I'm relentless. So I'm glad to see from what you said, Stephanie, to continue it, because after today, we're gonna resubmit again. So because of uh, a contracting officer that we've had over the years who is an absolute dream, I was able to find out why we were rejected. So which leads me to the other issue, inconsistent feedback. Um, but I know sometimes that's a systemic issue um, across the board in all workplaces. So this is in no way any finger pointing towards a contracting officer at GSA. Um, I think sometimes there could be complacency and maybe people don't want to pick up the phone or don't want to answer the questions. The difference that you make for a small business creates contracts for us. I will have, I can't even quantify, I have no idea how much business I could have won if I had the PSS in place um, during the summer when it should have been. Uh, so I just want to put out there to the contracting officers, I know sometimes you're thinking, oh gosh, here they are again. Or, I, or I'm overworked, which we all are, uh, and I have too much on my desk. If there's a way that you can at least just send an email, a quick call, something that points us in the right, right direction, you have no idea how much that communication means. And it's, it's valuable money-wise. Um, so... Those are my main challenges, but one thing I wanted to tell you about myself on a, on a fun side. Um, I'm also an author. I have a leadership book coming out next year that really talks about the joys and the sorrows of leadership, whether you're a small business owner or whether probably most everybody in this room is in leadership. So I'm committed to getting that done because I think more stories need to be told, especially by women, on how we've overcome. And I'm also, I recently published a children's book called Miss Crabapple and Her Magical Violin that also has stories of life lessons. So I wanted to share that because as I'm up here with my hat of my small business hat, and you know how sometimes business can be so rigid for all of us, um, there's a passionate side of me that loves to make a difference, and I do that through my writing. So I just wanted to share that with you. So there you go. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Larry Allen with Allen Federal Business Partners. As I look out into the auditorium today, I see a lot of familiar faces. And let me tell you how wonderful it is to see how young we all look. <laughs> I think that that's probably because of our benefit of uh, being able to work in government procurement and contracting. It helps us all stay youthful, at least evergreen. At least that's what we're going with today. So, I've been associated with the multiple award scheduled program since 1990, so I've seen a lot of changes over the years. Uh, for 20 years, I ran the Coalition for Government Procurement, Roger, now ably runs, uh, and along the way, I worked on many of the regulatory and legislative changes that have created the multiple award schedules program that we have today. So. A lot of legislation that came out in the 1990s, a lot of the regulations that have come out since. I also served on the multiple award schedule improvement panel uh, that made a series of recommendations. Uh, well, Alan, who's on the panel today, and several people who are in the audience. Uh, I've contributed to probably what's considered the main textbook on multiple award schedule contracting. I've taught classes, uh, both basic and advanced, for over 20 years in this arena, and uh, created the interagency contract class as an adjunct professor at George Washington University. I've been on radio, TV, here, there, and everywhere, talking about government procurement. I could have done something useful with my life, but as they say in The Godfather, this is the business we've chosen. So, uh, a little bit, so that's a little bit about me. Today, when I look at the Multiple Award Schedules program, I see a program that's actually on a little bit of a roll. One of the things that both myself and other longtime schedule commentators have said to GSA is, this program could really be something if you put some resources into it. And the current management team at the agency really deserves lots of credit, I think, for actually putting the resources into the program. If you've been with this program for more than five years, you know what it's like to have the multiple award schedules program 
not be uh, considered to be the, the cornerstone of the Federal Acquisition Service, or really even anything that has a future inside GSA. And now it does. And when you give the program a little bit of attention, when you give it a little bit of a marketing push, see what happens. You have agency after agency saying, we're going to not renew our own duplicative contract uh, for uh, technology or services. We're going to establish blanket purchase agreements through the GSA schedule. So whether it's the FBI, whether it's the Department of Homeland Security, or more recently, even DISA, that's talked about doing its huge Deos cloud procurement through the schedules program. This is an incredibly versatile and very useful acquisition program. And while some may say that the best days of the schedules program are behind it, I think that that's only true if the schedules program sits still. And one of the reasons why we have a full auditorium today and many people on the phone is that the program is not sitting still. So our management team, I think, deserves some absolute credit for moving the ball forward and keeping this program on top of changes that are going on, not just inside government, but in the realm of acquisition overall. My basic feeling about the consolidation of the GSA schedules program into one schedule is that that's a great move. Uh, it's been tried before, but we even had, you either have not had the technology or the inside support that's absolutely essential to making consolidation work. However, merely consolidating the schedules contracts is not going to get GSA all the way to its goal of making the program easier for customers to use. At the same time the program is consolidated, there must be a new online interface system, a new 21st century e-commerce experience so that federal customers can more easily search and find on the solutions they need. That's going to take some standardization of contract terms and conditions and some standardization of product and service descriptions. And while there may be some hesitancy among those in the room and elsewhere in the program to talk about standardization, let me just say that one of the keys to the schedules program remaining competitive is that we get that type of standardization. Because this afternoon we're going to be talking about commercial e-commerce programs that bring with them standard product definitions. And if we want the schedules program to remain competitive, it's going to have to have that same terminology as well. Outside of building a new user interface and making it a 21st century e-commerce experience, there are a couple of other things that I think the schedules program should consider. As we move into technology, and we're talking about transparency, and it's a fair point, Every day we have more transparency in the schedules program. Increasingly, the price reductions clause is an anachronism. It is a legacy from a bygone era, and it really has no place in a 21st century price for, uh, multiple award schedules program, particularly when we're talking about the advent of non-price schedules. So as the agency looks to make consolidations and changes, I think it's time to put the PRC on the chopping block. It serves today, really, as no more than a gotcha trap for companies that, by and large, are actually trying to do a good job managing complex contracts in a commercial and government world that simply did not exist when the price reductions clause was first initiated. Another challenge I'd like to mention to the agency is considering lowering the schedule industrial funding fee. That fee stands at 0.75% today for GSA and has not been changed for over 15 years. The last time we changed the schedule's fee from 0.75 to 2.75 from 1%, the technology that was in place was similar to that of the abacus. So we now have the technological capability to do that. And when you have the VA schedules program with their IFF of 0.5 and NASA soups that hovers somewhere around 0.37, you want to keep the program competitive by properly managing your access fee. I think we also need to move quickly to reestablish a nationally scoped training and marketing event. 
that I will not name by its previous title. Uh, there were two events held in 2015 and 2016 in Huntsville, Alabama that filled training rooms to capacity, and they were large training rooms as well. There's a direct benefit to gathering contractors, customers, and GSA officials in one place. In fact, one of the people I spoke with this morning said that one of the reasons we likely drove the type of attendance we did for this meeting was because of the relative dearth of in-person opportunities for everybody to get together face-to-face. -face. Reestablishing a marketing meeting is going to be important to that, whether you're a contractor, GSA, or especially a customer agency that wants to better understand these new programs. As GSA moves to a multiple vehicle marketplace, it will increasingly have to examine the different terms and conditions of each platform. These differing terms are going to drive differing pricing because they're differing terms. And recognizing this is essential. Part and parcel of this is being able to provide in-depth training internally to GSA's acquisition workforce. We've seen this most recently with the rollout of the uh, pilot program where you don't have to submit commercial sales practice information. Not all the contracting officers understood this. Simply put, getting the message out to the workforce internally takes time. Making sure that they understand the message and are ready to act on it takes time. You can't turn an acquisition workforce the size of GSAs around on a dime. Make sure that as we're talking about this, that we're bringing along the acquisition workforce so that they're part and parcel of the process and are at least as well informed about what the agency is up to as we are today. My final word is about consistency. Consistency is a wonderful thing, but I want to urge caution. We still need to maintain flexibility. That's a good word, too. We have long talked in the coalition when I was there, and I'm sure since Roger's been there, that consistency can mean consistently bad. So let's make sure that we're using some common sense and we're flexible at the same time as we're trying to move the program forward. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Julia Conti. I am a contracts director at CGI Federal who am managing their GSA schedules, portfolio, GWACs, and other IDIQs. Thank you, GSA, for inviting me to be here on this panel this morning. A little bit about myself. I have about over 20 years' experience in government contracting and have always worked for a large business. Um, early in my career, I was a contract administrator for a firm who generated about 80% of their revenue using GSA schedules. So needless to say, I got a lot of experience preparing task order proposals and managing task order awards. This was in addition to pursuing administering the full and open contracts for that business. From there, I moved on to another role uh, for a company managing their GSA schedules portfolio and helping to grow that business for them. So I've basically been doing that for the last 15 years. So been around the multiple award schedule program for the majority of my career, and overall I'll say the GSA schedules program is an efficient and streamlined tool for the government to satisfy their requirements, and it includes and covers a large industrial base. As I mentioned, as a contract administrator, I think it's the easiest proposal to put together in terms of price and terms and conditions perspective. Providing training um, to my internal customers on GSA schedules has been a large part of my role over the years. So I have a funny story to share with you. So we were offering training to our internal program managers and business development folks on how to use uh, GSA schedules. And after we provided the highlights and the features and capabilities, I had one gentleman raise his hand and go, this is illegal. I guess from his perspective, having pursued only full and open competition type of contracts, this all seemed all too easy for him. So I'm pleased to hear about the consolidation. I think it's a step in the right direction. Um, it's a great opportunity to re-energize and refresh the program. 
um, addressing industry needs as well as government needs and tossing in policy, process, technology all layered on top. The devil will be in the details, but I'm sure we'll get there. Uh, efficiency to some degree will be achieved by both government and industry, as Emily mentioned, reduced duplication efforts. For example, getting down to one award document, having one set of terms and conditions, not having to you know, review and accept number of refresh mods, having one schedule number, and so on. But assuming all else stays the same, and migrating SINs under one umbrella doesn't necessarily alleviate the burden of negotiations and compliance. So what would I recommend GSA change? I would say ensure consistency in the process and administration. In my experience, uh, it, I found it varies from center to center, within a center, from CO to CO, and even with the same CO from one mod to the next. Their interpretation of the forms, the data required, all differs. Um, the consolidation will sync up the period of performance, but I would say keep in mind on that next or forthcoming option renewal, it will be a heavy lift both for government and industry, where you would have had one or several SINs on a uh, individual schedule. Now you have them aggregated under one umbrella, and at that time it will become a heavy lift. Uh, take a look at reducing the number of SINs, perhaps making them broad enough to cover the scope. And um, be mindful of transitioning existing VPAs so that you don't um, unnecessarily um, uh, truncate their uh, period of performance in this migration. As it relates to systems modernization, I would say ensure that it, the solicitation aligns with the, with the process and the, and the system and reduce that need for the duplicative data entry. GSA, having received their authority for the unpriced services, I would say seek to incorporate that now and remove the price reduction clause. Lastly, on the customer side of the equation, the consolidation will prove to be a one-stop shop, but more will be needed to improve the customer experience and ensure that their understanding of the schedule's features and capabilities. I think as Larry said, making it easier is not necessarily just keeping it on autopilot. You need to focus on helping enable the customers to purchase and purchase their solutions um, to meet their requirements. Too often today, I see RFQs that ask for things that are not in conformance with the schedules and they are unnecessarily burdensome um, and, and are not required. The multiple award schedule program, 30 billion plus, needs continued outreach and assistance. While this is somewhat happening, I think GSA needs to put resources towards that for that continual support to those customer agencies, whether they're one-offs or high usage customers. It will better serve those agencies and allow the program to grow. So perhaps they can be customer liaisons. Uh, one final note, and I think contracts folks might uh, relate to this. At one time, I could tell I have seven schedules I have to manage, and I call it a portfolio, but now that we're going to one, I don't know, do you have a portfolio of one? <laughs> but it'll be a super one. Thanks. My name is Alan Schmatkin. I'm the Executive Vice President and Counsel for the Professional Services Council. The PSC is a national trade association. We represent over 400 member companies, all of whom sell professional services and technology services to the federal government. Uh, this is my second century working in the uh, multiple award schedule arena. Uh, a youthful two centuries at it, I might say. Uh, I started. Uh, as a, my first exposure was as a congressional staff member. Uh, then uh, when I left the Hill, I went to work for a company that had uh, numerous schedules as well as uh, telecommunication services to the federal government. Uh, I, I've been at the Professional Services Council for 17 years now, which just surprises the heck out of me every single day, as it does the organization. Uh, tried to fire me several times and I refused to leave. Uh, I was very pleased and privileged to uh, represent the Professional Services Council and our members on the Mass Advisory Panel that 
uh, Larry said that as well. And uh, uh, hard to believe that was 10 years ago that it was formed, and uh, eight years ago since the final panel recommendations were made. And uh, when I was invited to participate in this uh, panel, I appreciate the invitation very much. I had a chance to go back and look at those mass panel uh, recommendations from uh, 2010, and many of them are still very relevant. In fact, we're still we're talking about some of them uh, today. Uh, I've had the opportunity uh, through PSC uh, to uh, work with GSA closely on the schedules program, the evolution of it as it moved from products to services and to solutions, and now to an almost as, as a service model. Uh, along the way, we've seen some experimentation with a variety of different tools and, and opportunities, uh, some uh, better than others, some more uh, valuable to others. Uh, but at least the, the program has tried to keep pace with uh, what the agencies need because at its core, uh, the schedules program are nothing more than an enabler to help the federal agencies achieve their missions. Uh, and I think it'll be important as we look at the consolidation that we not simply stop at consolidating to where we are today, uh, but that we provide the tools for agencies to, uh, to look to 2020 and beyond. And wh where are the agencies going? What are those marketplaces uh, likely to look at? That'll add to the challenge uh, of making sure that the uh, scopes of work and the schedules programs are as flexible as they can be. Uh, to meet the changing marketplaces and needs of the companies and the, uh, and the users from the agencies. Uh, to its credit, uh, GSA, uh, through its Interact and uh, other programs, has been among the most uh, successful and uh, respected in terms of its communications tools uh, and its ability to keep the community informed of what's going on in, in, within the agency and among the changes. And I compliment them for doing that. I encourage them to continue to be a leader in terms of communication so with the vendors, with the agencies, uh, with the marketplace, so that uh, others are well informed about uh, not only the opportunities, but uh, as uh, Ms. Murphy said in her opening, uh, what are some of the unknowns and the unknown unknowns that the agency needs to be aware of. We saw some of those uh, when we engaged uh, closely with GSA on the professional services schedule consolidation uh, that started a couple of years ago. There's some very valuable lessons that were learned from that uh, initiative, uh, some of which I hope are repeated and some of which I hope are not repeated. Uh, but there was a good experience. Those of you who have been uh, that participated and took advantage of that consolidation uh, ought to share those uh, experiences uh, again to make sure that they're part of the learning uh, that, uh, that took place. Uh, and as we saw with the mass modifications at that time, again, dealing primarily with uh, professional services, uh, there were a couple of those uh, terms and conditions that have been uh, the bane of many of us, uh, like the uh, coverage of the Service Contract Act uh, and uh, the mythology of self-deleting clauses in, uh, in those mass modifications. Uh, so, uh, watch, there's some good lessons. We're, uh, we intend to be active participants in this consolidation and sharing those issues uh, uh, with the agency as well. Uh, but there's some related issues uh, to keep in mind as well as we go through the consolidation. Uh, first of all, the, the schedules are not the only tool in the GSA toolbox, and they're certainly not the only tool in the agency's toolbox. Uh, and so, as the agency looks across uh, other GSA reforms and other GSA IDIQ contracts and other uh, agency IDIQ contracts, the whole idea of category management and how that relates to both the future schedules program as well as future contracting uh, by the federal agencies will be an important uh, issue to keep in mind. Uh, how this new revised schedule, the consolidated schedule today and in the future, uh, compares with some of the other competing vehicles uh, that have been designated as best in class by the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, there's also the, the issue about predictability for agencies, for contractors, uh, and for others as we, uh, as we look to put the schedules together. I'll echo the comments of, uh, of Larry and Julia about uh, the anachronism of the price reduction clause. Uh, We've been an opponent of that clause forever uh, and will continue to, uh, to be an advocate for its elimination. It, it never made sense in services, 
never make sense in solutions, uh, and it uh, really should have no place in a, in a future marketplace and an as-a-service business model. Uh, so uh, we look forward to the opportunity to continue to engage and uh, welcome uh, engagement both here and uh, in the future in support of GSA's consolidation efforts. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, and first of all, I want to thank GSA for inviting uh, the Coalition for Government Procurement to attend this meeting and participate. And I want to thank uh, Stephanie for moderating this panel and all the panelists for, for participating today. And thank you all for coming. This is a great conversation. I look forward to a great conversation here. Um, just a little bit about myself, I guess, is uh, I worked for GSA for 20 years. Was, uh, in, uh, 15 of those years, I was in the Office General Counsel. My clients were the Federal Supply Service, first of all, and the Federal Technology Service when, those, when they merged uh, the, the two into the Federal Acquisition Service. They were my client as well. I, I advised the GSA Schedules Program, uh, both on a policy level and specifically the IT Schedule 70. I also advised the GWAC programs primarily as well. Um, and I uh, did that for about 10 years, and then I went uh, and became part of the problem. I became one of the clients, right? So I worked in acquisition policy with Jeff um, uh, in acquisition management uh, at the Federal Supply Service first, uh, and was responsible for a lot of the policies and procedures regarding the operations of the GSA schedules program. Um, then, then during that time, I also served on the SARA panel, Services Acquisition Reform Panel, and I'm glad to see the uh, unpriced schedule because that concept originated um, with recommendations that came out of the SARA panel um, with regard to the IT schedule uh, uh, 70 and unpriced professional services line items concept that the, that the panel recommended that GSA take a look at that. So we're gratified. It is quite a bit, few years later, but at least it, it's got done and look forward to that implementation. Um, then I left GSA, ultimately went to work for Mayor Brown, where I advised clients dealing with the GSA schedules program, amongst other things. Um, and now to turn to the topic for the day. Um, you know, first of all, I just want to say the schedules program is a remarkable, remarkable program. It has been around in some form or another since 1910. Okay, it is, it's older than GSA in some ways, right? Um, and it's, it's probably the longest running procurement program in one form or another in the history of the United States, I'd fair to argue. Um, and it is currently the largest commercial item contracting program in government. Um, just during my career um, in government procurement, and, the, and, it's, and it's, its strength is it's what we're talking about today, the ability to transform, to meet market conditions, to, to adopt new practices. That's really about leadership, and that's what I think GSA has been blessed with over the years to get to that point. Um, so just in my career, what we've seen is uh, services added to the schedules in the 1990s. The schedules went from a $3 billion program to a $30 billion program. Post 9-11, the schedules were, were agencies turned to that for translation uh, support services in the battle of the war on terror. Uh, post the financial crash, agencies turned to the schedules program to put BPAs in place to, pro to provide financial audit support as we dealt with the, you know, with the uh, aftermath of the financial crisis. Um, and today, we have the schedules we have been used to create uh, identity protection BPAs in response to the cyber breaches over the last few years. Um, and also now DOD is turning to it for its cloud, the DOS procurement, and the replacement for NetSense. Um, those are just reflect when there's, a, when there's things that need to get done, and you need to do them quickly, and you need to do them effectively and get good value for the taxpayer and for customer agencies. Time and time again, this government has looked to the schedules program. And I'd like to say this year is a, uh, 2018, I like to, is the year of the schedule. And let's just talk real quickly about the things that have happened. Order level materials, or ODCs, um, that is adopted in the regulation. 
huge transformative uh, opportunity for product and product solutions and services across the schedules program. Uh, Jeff is in the audience here. Jeff is the uns unsung hero of ODCs and order level materials and his work getting that through the agency. When I came to the coalition in, in 2010, 2011, early 11, the very first issue members, Ted, members came to me with was ODCs. And we did a white paper, we talked to GSA, and ultimately a lot with um, you know, the new administration and Jeff's leadership, it got there. That's a huge issue. Um, the commercial supplier agreement and addressing intellectual property rights and allocation of risk, that was adopted this year. Uh, this, this something that people don't talk a lot about, streamlining of the ordering process this year, huge win for GSA, an increase in the micro-purchase threshold to $10,000 for individual orders, and in the increase in the, uh, in the simplified acquisition threshold to $250,000. Huge streamlining opportunities for the schedules program. DDR has been made optional, so agencies, uh, so contractors can make good business decisions on what should apply to them. And now we're talking about um, BPA growth, 46% of the dollar volume going under schedules now are through BPAs. That means GSA has been effective in educating agencies how to leverage requirements, compete those requirements in, in the context of BPAs. Uh, in fact, four BPAs are considered best in class. The identity protection one, Jansan, MRO, and the wireless are all identified as best in class. And a couple line items on IT Schedule 70 are also identified as best in class in the category management initiative. It's the power of simplicity, the power of creating a competitive market where there are millions and millions of items and thousands of contractors all out there trying to do business with the federal government. Now, the single schedule concept, it's something that our membership at the coalition is uh, endorses. It's a great opportunity to leverage solutions to reduce artificial barriers between scheduled contracts with regard to scope. Um, there's pr it's an opportunity to increase competition and increase access to the commercial market. Um, some of the things that we need to think about as we implement, we've heard a, a lot of them already, I, I won't dwell on them, but management of the program. It's got to be unity of effort. I'm confident with the leadership of this administrator uh, Commissioner Alan Thomas, Stephanie, and the, and the entire team, unity of effort towards a common goal of getting the single schedule. That's one of the hurdles that the agency faced when it tried to do corporate single schedule back about two decades ago. Uh, that performance measure has got to focus on that unity effort and the strategic goal. Okay? Um, systems, and it's already been touched on, but the systems have to keep pace with the changes in the contracts and even have to be ahead of the changes in the contracts. You have to be able to effectively, customers have to be able to effectively find and acquire what they, what they need through when you go to a single schedule. And the flip side of it, the systems have to meet the needs of uh, the contractors and the ability to more efficiently and effectively execute mods and contract actions. Since and I would just say, don't be sinful. <laughs> There's a lots of duplication of sins. There's overlap of sins. Um, this is an opportunity to rationalize the sin structure. And, uh, what I, and I've heard about NAICS, but I, our experience, and one of the things that I know the furniture uh, folks in Iowa Center looked at trying to consolidate sins to make it look more like the commercial marketplace. And I think that should be the, you know, the driving light of when you're thinking about the SIN structure, the underlying where the rubber meets the road, where you have the task orders, how do you effectively make that look like the commercial marketplace? That will increase efficiency for government and it will increase the efficiency for contractors to be able to deliver better value and better pricing. Implement the unpriced schedule concept. Enough said. Uh, eliminate, as Larry and Alan and we all, like, we're in violent agreement about the price reduction clause. And just to echo on that, it's, it's an acronist, I can't even say it, I'm gonna, thank you, uh, thank you, Alan. Um, but it goes back to a 1970s, 1980s, 1970s policy. And at a time when the schedules were a mandatory source, there was no competition requirements under the schedules program. It wasn't open, continuous open seasons. We didn't have the internet. 
you know, uh, it's horse and buggy days. So it was built in a time where you could maybe understand why there was a price reduction clause because of the mandatory nature and the single contracts and lack of competition at the order level. Now the market should drive pricing. It sh the schedules need to be open to the market and ironically the price reduction clause limits the market. Companies don't put stuff on contract because of the risk of the price reduction clause. They don't offer their latest technology because of the price reduction clause. And then ultimately, from a policy perspective, the government needs to make, and I think it's time for it to do so, and we've said this multiple times, the price reduction clause, the government should not have a clause in its contracts that as a condition of doing business with the government, it restricts your ability to do business in the private sector. That's what the price reduction clause does, and it needs to be eliminated. Okay, and I just have one more area, and it's great. Uh, this is a great, great event, and this afternoon is going to be great. And this is where I want to touch on, we've heard about the integrated marketplace, a holistic marketplace across the program. Um, so I think the last area uh, that GSA um, and, and you know, Larry talked about IFF, all those things should be on the table as you're looking at re-transforming re the future of the schedules. The last area I think that GSA needs to take a look at is contract requirements. Okay? And I do that in the context of the marketplace as a whole that, that GSA is envisioning. And having different channels with different sets of contract requirements. What is core? Are there core requirements? We talk to our members and the things that they hear about and talk about trade agreements at. Counterfeit. Um, cyber and supply chain risk. That's coming for every, it's ubiquitous, and that's coming for everybody. It's going to be part, that is going to be, you know, over the next decade, you know, the, where commercial item contracting and cyber and supply chain risk come together is where the, rule, the, the energy, the interest, the rules is all going to come. You're seeing it every day in the newspaper. That's a big deal. Competition and leveraging requirements. We've seen, as I mentioned, BPAs. 46% of the spend now through BPAs. That's opportunities for companies. That's opportunities for customer agencies. So thinking about those things, what kind of, you know, are you going, you know, and asking the question, what makes sense? Do you have two systems? One, and Stephanie, I have to quote you now as I wrap up here. So one of the things that you've said at multiple events is that one of the biggest value adds that customer agencies see with GSA is compliance, right? You've done surveys on it, GSA's done a lot of surveys on it. That's a big deal for your customers. That's a value add that GSA provides. So what's core to the, to, to the requirements? And, that's, and what isn't core in making those decisions? So when you look, think about the conversation this afternoon, the current model as proposed essentially has no core requirements. Trade Agreements Act doesn't apply. There's no cyber or supply chain risks, uh, it, you know, requirements that I'm aware of identified in the RFI. And so, and people are, are using the micro, the micro purchase threshold is cited as the process by which those things are waived. Well, I think it's, you, the, you're putting the cart before the horse. The conversation should be about, with all the stakeholders involved, and I don't know what the right answer is, but I'm just raising it, are there core requirements that should apply, regardless of the process? The process is a streamlined process. It waves a bunch of things. So when you, and I'm just finally just use trade agreements as an example. The purpose of the Trade Agreements Act, and you go on the USTR website, is to promote, you know, the, to promote fair treatment of American-made products by foreign governments. That's one of the goals of it. We apply it here so that we treat companies who've signed up to it in a fair manner. That translates into American jobs and American opportunity. And one of the things that I hear from our members is you, one channel where the Trade Agreements Act doesn't apply where theoretically, and I'm just saying theoretically, 
100% of the, of the items bought under that channel could be from non-TAA countries. So you could buy 100% from China. Whereas under the schedules program, the rule is zero from non-TAA countries. That's a, I think that's a fair conversation to have about what are the policy imperatives of that type of con government contract requirement. And it is, is it meeting certain things that are elemental to our federal government? And cyber is the other example. Because at the end of the day, what is more fundamental to the federal government than protecting the United States and maintaining our freedom? And if, the, if supply chain is compromised or cyber is compromised through acquisition of some sort, inadvertently, by accident, or whatever, you know, that, that's a big deal. I think those are some of the conversations I look forward to as we move forward in this, and I know our members look forward to it. And rather than focusing on a process waiving requirements, I think a more healthy approach and a holistic approach is try to have a conversation with the entire procurement community about whether there are certain requirements that should apply, and then streamline the process through commercial platforms in that manner. It can be done. There's there's multiple e-commerce platforms out there, whether they're um, commercial ones, whether there's GSA Advantage, whether DOD's building FedMall, um, and I'm not citing those as the way to go, I'm just saying there's all kinds of varieties and flavors of e-commerce platforms. And the technology is there to do the screening that's necessary, if it is necessary. And the statute 846 specifically contemplates the administrator of GSA, or really GSA, providing whoever the marketplace provider is the necessary information to screen products. So to me, that means vetting companies and products, whether their trade agreements are compliant, and providing that information to the marketplace. And so when you think about that, the only, I bring this up at the end because we are talking about a holistic marketplace across the board, and how do the two programs interrelate? And, you know, by the, by the terms of the statute, one of the things that GSA has to assess is the impact of the program, of the e-commerce platform, on pre-existing programs like the schedules and small business. And with that, I will stop, finally. Okay, so first I want to thank everyone for their comments and their insight that they've brought to this panel today. Um, we're going to turn it over to the audience for Q&A. We have about 30 minutes. I'm sure Krista will do the one question left sign when we get close. Um, we can do a combination of both some questions that are online and that are in the room. But if you guys would like your microphone brought to you, raise your hand. Or if you would like, you can come up to one of these four. And I'm going to also invite the panelists. If you guys have comments or insights on what is being asked, to please go ahead and provide that information. Uh, we have a question online from Meg Whitehouse, Evergreen Fire and Security. Would like to know how will the consolidation affect competition for GSA contractors? So, with the consolidation, we'll still have the need to do it at the have categories within the consolidated schedule, which will promote a competition more so at that order level because agencies will be able to find those correct industry partners in which the category they're actually looking to buy, which will promote a better competition across those industry partners for that. I have a follow-up question, actually, to oh. that one, which is, how do you, ins I heard a couple of times mentioned that, it, you know, we're still going to be buying at the category level, selling at the category level. As a person who sells products, mm -hmm. and the issue that my company has right now is we're on four different schedules with products that we consider related. How do you keep the category idea from just devolving into the schedules with the same problems? It, it, it seems... Yeah, so, yes. <laughs> so there are two different things with um, products. For products that you're going to be purchasing through Advantage and orders within that side of things, um, you'll continue to search for those actual products and not have to worry about 
what sin do I look under and that kind of thing for those things. For those that are going through like eBuy or FedBizOps or something like that, that is a more large scale. Um, because you'll be assigned those different categories and when we clean them, hopefully there won't be, you won't have products on two separate like intersections within your contract. You'll be just offering them once. But as long as you have one of those categories, if someone puts out an offer on, a request on one of those categories, your company would come up so that you could actually put together your solution that you need to do rather than hoping they pick the right schedule to find you, if that makes sense. It does make sense. So my follow-up question is that right now that becomes an issue, be, uh, the same issue. I heard you say if you have that category. So for right now, mm -hmm. people put, uh, I'm in heavy equipment. Okay, people yeah. don't, un the, the end users, the purchasers are not the end users, right? So yeah. the purchasers frequently don't understand the product. They put it in some sort of bizarre sin, category, schedule, whatever it is they put it in that doesn't actually apply. And so then we never see the solicitation because it's been designated something that it's not. Um, in the terms of seeing the problems that we didn't know existed, it seems to me that if it has to be defined by a category, we're maintaining a similar issue. So yeah, so that's one of the things that we have to actually really kind of go through and really clean up while we're looking across this duplication because that is something that we noticed when we were doing that. Um, it's also creating actual real titles that help logically get that purchasing officer and gearing towards that person that doesn't really know what they're buying, but actually provide that description in there so they can be like, oh yeah, that's what I need over there, kind of thing, rather than them trying to guess which schedule or sin that they're doing. Um, but trying to figure out what that verbiage is to guide them down that path, because there has to be some delineation, otherwise it's so big it's just, it's unmanageable at that point. So it's trying to find that happy medium of where those sit so that we don't make it overly cumbersome, but make sure that the right RFQs are going to the right industry segments. And they're not going to, let's say, a bunch of professional services contractors when they're actually trying to buy a backhoe or something right. large. <laughs> but that is one of those things. But I definitely um, would recommend, um, as we go through this, to definitely participate in different things that we put out on Interact, or even just emailing me your different thoughts and different things like that, because that helps us get to those correct verbiage, because you guys know what you're selling better than we do at the end of the day. Right. There's, there's not going to be a day where I suddenly am the queen of all description knowing. It's just, <laughs> it's not gonna happen. I don't have the time to learn it all. So you guys know it best. So helping us with those things, and we're actually, before we, while we're going through this, we'll be putting out this information on Interact for comment consistently. So what we're gonna be asking is when we do those categorizations and subcategorizations, that you guys look through those different titles, and we'll try and put it in a way that it's chunked out so that you can easily find your section and so that you guys can say, yes, I could easily find it. Yes, it had the words that I needed in there. Yes, it made sense to me. And yes, I found the one person in my company who has no clue what we're doing and they could find it. So if it hits all of those markers, then we're on a good path. But if it doesn't, then it's where you guys need to really come back and tell us, no, 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 no. The words should be something in this arena instead. But that's one of the things we'll be going through this year. Got it. And not to monopolize the microphone, but <laughs> I'm standing here. So, um, As a follow-up to that, clearly the, techno the technology needs to follow, and several yes. of the technology projects that have begun have fizzled, failed, whatever. Where are the finances going to come from? Is GSA prepared to dedicate the finances to really improving the technology so that this works? So yeah, we are looking into that. So one of the things Emily had mentioned was the robotic process automation. And I know Jeff Lau, I see him in the audience today who his region is running that project. We also have um, that is co-working with my group through um, the information technology category. We're looking into distributed ledger technology so we can actually ledger the information. 
Um, some of these emerging texts will allow us to, as we go through this, and one of the first things you guys will see a slightly different screen on if you're getting a new contract um, after March, will be like the financial determination. So what we're doing is we're process mapping out all of the different um, items you would have to go through through e-offer to get on contract or through e-mod to adjust your contract and after process mapping it out, seeing what we can use from digitization of data, but also from ledgering and then pulling and syncing that information so that A, you guys aren't guessing what you're supposed to put in. It's more intuitive. You guys can figure out what information you need to gather. And the first one we'll be testing is that financial determination because for most of you guys who know, Currently, for financial determination, you kind of have to guess what information you need, and you put it in an attachment and others, and you hope your contracting officer can find it. Um, so this way, we'll be able to be like, oh, you need these fields filled out, and you need these attachments, and the contracting officer knows where they're at. They don't have to ask you. Or if you're missing a page, the contracting officer doesn't have to go back to you, or worst case scenario, reject your offer because you're missing a page. These kind of things will be overlaying inside of eOffer eMod and we'll slowly start taking each section until we can eventually move into this new technology. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi, I'm Steve Armstrong from MSC Industrial Supply. Um, we supply a lot of products, industrial products, to the GSA's customers. And in thinking about what we're going to be talking about this afternoon, which are the e-commerce portals, which are going to be very important to us to sell our products, we're trying to figure out what impact that's really going to have on our schedule. I mean, if people are buying, if our customers, joint customers, are buying in the e-commerce portal, for suppliers like MSC, won't that mean our schedule is virtually meaningless going forward? So I think right now the honest answer is we're not sure how it's going to do. I think the first stage we need to really do is get through that proof of concept and see how that works all together. And we're working closely, my group is working very closely with the commercial platform team to always be involved in that thing, but at this point, honestly, we, we're not sure how that's going to affect it. We're hoping um, that as we go forward and the proof of concept happens, we'll be able to bring that industry comment in and discuss with you guys what the best solution going forward is for that and what is the most profitable and competitive. So what's best for industry, what's best for our agencies, and what works for GSA as a broker between everyone. Okay, thank you. Yes. Hi, Tom, this is DSAP. Um, thank you very much for this panel. I think all your presentations were, were extremely valuable to me. Um, Roger, I appreciated um, your comment on the micro-purchase threshold as uh, Larry and Alan and others here who uh, worked on the development and implementation of that threshold. I think um, I, I appreciated uh, recognizing that you, you don't build a program on a waiver. You, um, that when that threshold was put in place, it was not even envisioned. To, to be leveraged in that kind of a context because it, it just didn't exist. Um, but you raised a, a number of things, Roger. You raised this whole cyber issue. We have the Deliver Uncompromised report. Um, you've, uh, your organization has uh, produced a study which now represents the second study showing the price advantage associated with GSA advantage over piloting of certain e uh, commercial e-commerce um, solutions. Are we hitting a point where it's appropriate to take a pause, do a deep dive on exactly what we're doing here in the context of the policies driving micro-purchase, the policies driving supply chain risk management, the deliver on, comp on compromise policies, and some of the findings you're seeing in these studies to assess exactly what we're doing with these parallel programs that you've identified um, and others have identified here with their questions? Um, that's a tough question there, Tom. Um, I, I guess the, the way I would answer it is I'd go back to what I said earlier. I think the conversation initially needs to be about our, you know, about 
um, what are the government's requirements or not? You know, is trade agreements, because you are creating dual marketplaces with different terms and conditions, that affects from a company's perspective, and a company is talking about what does it mean for their schedule, well, if you have to comply with the Trade Agreements Act on one contract and you don't have to apply, you know, it, it, you know comply with it on a marketplace, and they're both channels where potentially billions of dollars can go through, um, you know, that impacts competition. It can distort the competition if you go to low-cost low places that aren't TAA. Um, I mean, that bleeds into the cyber. Anything that's plugged into the mark in, into a network in the future, I just see different sets of rules, even if it's a commercial item acquisition. We're starting to see that coming out of the Department of Defense already in some specific acquisitions where, you know, even though the guidance is it doesn't apply to commercial item, they're including clauses. Um, so, yeah, so, I, so I think you'd start there, like what should or shouldn't apply, and try, because I'm confident that the problems can, and the issues can be solved, and that e-commerce can be leveraged to, to support the government in a very effective way, whatever e-commerce is, and there's three different models that are identified in the report, but also e-commerce through existing programs as well. Um, so I think, you know, just looking at those requirements, and I think the big thing, and not to put too much pressure on GSA, is what they say in their report coming out in March. Because in the, you read the statute, there are specific things that they're supposed to address. Like, they're supposed to address their conversations with agencies about um, unique requirements relating to health, I, health products or IT products and cyber. They're supposed to assess and provide um, what's the impact on pre-existing programs? They're supposed to try to identify, you know, what should or shouldn't apply. Um, what 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 we really haven't heard is why it should or shouldn't apply. I guess in its basic terms, it's we're using the micro purchase threshold, therefore they do not apply. But there hasn't been a real explanation from a policy perspective as to why they should or shouldn't apply. And I don't think some of those requirements, if they're core. You know, they're going to apply the, st the FASA says to the maximum extent practicable. You know, you use commercial terms and conditions. And so, so does 846, that you're supposed to the maximum extent practicable use the platform provider's terms and conditions. So that begs the question, are there some things that the government needs to have in place or not? And, you know, what the feedback I get from our member companies is you have one program where you're going to have all those things or you have what the government has currently identified as core, like Trade Agreements Act, and you're going to have another program that's arguably a direct competitor in some ways, at least that's the way companies and industry see it, um, where those core requirements do not apply. So how does GSA reconcile that? And do you go to, first, first question, why are you waiving it? What is the public interest? What is the cost-benefit analysis of waiving something? And maybe there are policy reasons. You know, we haven't even talked about small business and what the impact is there. So. Just as a quick follow-up, could I ask, does this have implications for systems integrators? If, uh, if the systems integrators are provided GFE uh, yeah. under, uh, under the, a one program versus another, and then there's uh, some kind of catastrophe. Do you have a right. forensics issue and a liability issue associated with We've heard from a number of systems integrators that that's a real issue with regard to buying things and plugging them into networks and, or, or, or without even you know, into a network that a system integrator is managing on behalf of, the, of uh, customer agencies and how the government handles that. You know, these aren't... And this, is, this isn't about, no, you shouldn't do it, or yes, you should do it. It's about how do we do it in a smart way that makes sense, that takes advantage as, of the dyna dynamic nature of the commercial market, while at the same time, you know, protecting you know, whether it's cyber or whatever policy imperative the government has in place. That's why I go back to the question, why? Hmm. And answering those questions is, I think, a very positive approach to it, and it gets every, all, all the stakeholders involved. So thank you very much. Uh, just to add on to that briefly, I, I think that you know, Roger definitely uh, addressed that uh, pretty thoroughly, but this is absolutely a management issue for GSA, understanding that these different platforms are going to have different outcomes, they're going to have different pricing 
uh, outcomes uh, and profiles. Uh, we're in a big community, and there are a lot of, uh, we have oversight community, both inside the agency and on Capitol Hill. Uh, we have the, the fourth estate that does its job. We want to make sure that from an acquisition management standpoint that we stay out in front of these issues and realizing A, that they're going to happen, and B, what does that mean for terms of how certain of these programs are going to move forward, uh, what are our justifications going to look like, what are our policy decisions, what are our business management justifications. These are all things that uh, the acquisition management team is going to need to consider because if not, then we're quickly going to lose the ability to drive this train to where we think it should go and instead it's going to be taken over by people who uh, look at it and say, well, the government's doing something wrong, why are they doing that? Which is really only a surface analysis, but as we all know, because we all live in this area, uh, surface analysis is sometimes as far as it goes. Hi, um, I'm Jennifer Kirkhoff. I'm from Phillips Healthcare. Um, it, my questions actually relate to a number of topics that have been brought up this morning. Um, the one thing that we've noticed is that while the 652A is for non-configurable de uh, medical devices, it could be anything from a Band-Aid to scalpel, um, it also includes things that have become highly technical and highly complex that integrate into systems. So things like a patient monitor. So today, the way that you buy it, if you use the schedule that, G, uh, that the VA is responsible for, you purchase the device on, one, on the schedule 65, and then you buy the interfaces, the integration into the EHR system, all of those things open market. <coughs> Um, because there's no place for it. And healthcare has evolved tremendously, so much so that you created a sin on the, on the Schedule 70. But what we didn't consider is all of those, thing, those companies that touch the patients who have things like health informatics and other things like that, where they might be a class two medical device, uh, not an imaging equipment, because there's certainly a contract for that, but as IT or health IT evolves and they're touching the IT systems inside of these agencies, and I don't just mean the VA and the DOD, we're also talking about DHS, we're also talking about HHS. These are customers who would like to be able to acquire these things, but right now there's no vehicle for it, there's no schedule for it, because you can't put all of these things onto the existing schedule. So I'm wondering if we're gonna think about those things and whether we should talk through it, because it's also, they're also uh, commercial devices that have TAA issues, and th and there's just things that we have to think about because there's a lot of money being spent on these things that are not really being tracked, and they're not really easy for other for the agencies to acquire. So yeah, um, over the last couple of months, almost last year, um, GSA has been making a more concerted effort to work more closely with the VA and their schedules. Um, whether that be by incorporating them into our systems and different things like that, um, some of these things have started to rise to the surface. Is the need of their schedules and the scope of their schedules, um, there is a definite disconnect and whether or not um, our side for mass, we have the ability to include the other half of what we have done on that. So like the first step, I, um, the information technology category has added those health IT SINs, um, but you're right, it hasn't quite gotten to that full solution situation yet. Mm -hmm. um, I think what we'll see is over the next year um, and in the following years, GSA continuing to work with the VA to see whether or not there are, are categories we need to add to our schedules to at least facilitate this while they're determining what they want to do with their schedules as well. Mm -hmm. um, this way we can bring that solution even though it will be somewhat piecemealed because it will be on two different vehicles. Yeah, yeah, and that's what we're finding is that people are buying things on soup so they can avoid yeah. trying to figure out how to go through a, GS, a piece through a GSA schedule, a piece through a 65, a piece here, and it's very hard for your customers to acquire the next generation of healthcare IT. Yeah. So yeah, that has been um, 
a concern that even the VA has brought up themselves, and I know that they have been concerned also with their pulse time of being able to get certain things onto contract quick enough mm -hmm. to keep up with different things such as NASA soup. Um, so we're hoping to expand the communication with them more this year okay. and see where we can work together to start helping government agencies, but also help industry be able to provide that solution base because it is something that, I mean, us in our personal lives, we don't piecemeal out what we're buying. So right. if you go somewhere and you order furniture, for example, you don't say, okay, I just want the furniture. I've got to go somewhere else and find someone else who can install it. You, you want to buy it all in one thing. Exactly. So as GSA definitely moves toward this more solution base, we're hoping that the VA will look into it as well, but we are opening those communications with them. We just, it's very early in that stage at this point. Well, we'd be happy to help, and <laughs> the, industry, the trade industry that we're part of would also be happy to help as an, as an organization to provide some insights on that. So yes, definitely. Good morning. Um, I'm Randa Thayer with Shell Industries, and we carry a Schedule 72. And much like a lot of schedule holders here, these schedules tend to blend with several other schedules, hence the reason we're doing this. But my question is, what measures are we putting in place to ensure that we don't have vendors that maybe specialize in general construction or in furniture and installation start creeping into a floor covering um, segment where maybe they're not necessarily the subject matter expert, and at the end of the day, ultimately not giving the customer the quality install that they're looking for. So that exact reason was the reason we realized that we kind of had to keep a basic category structure, not only just because it would be too large to not have it, but we have set up this certain subject matter expertise throughout the acquisition centers to ensure that people and contractors were in the right groupings, basically, and to ensure that those regulations and contract terms and conditions and whether or not they can even be on schedule or that item could be on schedule, because I know sometimes that line gets a little blurry um, of how far you can go, basically, and where that caps out on there. So we will be keeping that subject matter expertise alive, but the other thing we'll be doing is we'll be having the acquisition centers, they're already starting to talk more to each other, but we'll be definitely moving to a more enterprise view on that thing so that we can identify different CEOs who have that. So if a CEO who mainly has done professional services, for example, gets a category that they're not used to, they have someone to contact to get that information on there so that they can help guide the contractor or prospective contractor to ensure that they're fulfilling everything in the right terms and conditions, but also avoid certain gaps, basically, where we could have something come in that is buffering on that zone and maybe they shouldn't be quite on there. Well, so just a quick follow-up question then. Um, as these conversations began, a lot of our uh, strategic partners in the industry continue to come to us kind of asking, well, I hold a, a hardware superstore or I hold a furniture or, um, or a package room contract, and so they're coming to us now requesting these letters of supplies to make sure that they are ahead of the game. So are you guys going to be listing um, maybe a thought process on different schedules that could be grouped together that could overlap and allow some of our hardware superstores to scale, sell the SIN numbers that are underneath the Schedule 72? So yeah, so... Um, that's kind of where it all kind of started. So what we actually, when we first started doing this, we weren't quite sure if we were gonna to go to one. So we were trying to find pockets where there was no overlap. <laughs> what we found out is no pocket existed. There was always something that was crossing over somewhere. But one of the things that we'll be doing um, as we go forward with this is doing that emerging technology and with eOffer to help basically build those paths, um, expanding the mass plain language roadmap that's on gsa.gov so we can show those categories and give examples of different things. But this will basically take all those special item numbers that are essentially the same but on different contract vehicles and bring them together into one category. So there won't be this, oh, I sell hammers, I need eight schedules to sell them. 
you'll just need that one category. So this will bring that kind of um, ability in there. And also, the other thing it kind of, we always have not issues with, but concerns from industry about is, I sell hardware, for example, but I only sell stuff that I manufacture. And the hardware superstore isn't a good fit for me. And I don't really feel I fit anywhere else. I feel like I should fit here, but I'm kind of guessing at this point because I know this is something I could sell the government, but because I don't fit this exact model, I can't quite <coughs> find my first footing. So creating a world where it's a little bit easier to figure out where I go is one of the steps that we're really trying to do while we do this process. Thank you. Hey, okay, we Stephanie, have a, a couple I, of questions oh, okay. online. Hold on, um, Slavi, hold on. Roger has something. So I, did, I don't want to beat it at horse, but I did want to just clarify one thing. When I'm also talking about cyber and supply chain risk, also another big issue for our members is counterfeit, you know, our gray market items that, you know, the schedules t t addresses. And just put that out there. And I actually had a question, if you don't mind, if that's okay. Is this an opportunity through the consolidation to take another look at evergreen contracting in terms of making evergreen truly evergreen? So um, I think it's an opportunity to look at everything, but we kind of have to bucket things. So bucketing them into what would be potentially rulemaking, what would be um, something that we could change. Um, for Evergreen, I would suspect that that would need to go through a process of rulemaking, so that would be something that we could put on the table. However, it's not gonna be an instantaneous thing, nor will be in time for the consolidation. But, Zavi, let's do your question last. Just a couple of quick questions. We had one from Stacy Zelensky. Will contractors still have the size determination at the schedule level? If so, how will that determination work? And then a second question from Joyce Nowak from Caldwell's Windowware. Arson has a small business set aside. Will that continue or will it go away? So for the socioeconomic um, statuses, um, so we will still be using the preponderance NAICS and that preponderance NAICS will determine your size standard and your socioeconomic status for your contract vehicle. Um, that being said, I do know that there is a FAR case in place that you have to have a NAICS per category. And once that FAR case comes in place, that will kind of change how that goes and that will more move that socioeconomic to the order level, but that won't happen until that FAR case and other system fixes are completed. So for right now, it will stick with the preponderance snakes. So whatever your preponderance snakes, if it's small business, if it's woman-owned, whatever that is, that will stay the same. But I think we're out of time for that, and I want to thank everyone for coming and for all of the great questions. If you have more questions, um, we do have an email address that we have multiple people that manage the mass PMO at gsa.gov for those of you guys who have gotten emails about the sunsetting of 72A. You've seen this email address because it's who you're emailing to ask when this is happening. Um, but this email address will come to myself and some other people on my team to answer those questions. Also, we will be providing updates along the way and opportunities to comment through Interact this entire period. But I do welcome any comments or questions that anyone has at any time. With that, we'll close it up and thanks to the panelists.